Uh, welcome, everybody. This is, um, I, I am Rick Corey, um, John Bell, Bethany Engstrom. Uh, we are researchers in collaboration. Well, one of the things we're hoping to do today is give you some insight to our research over the last uh, four years, uh, probably longer individually where we sit. Um, but the first thing we'd like to start right off with is the big question is what is collaboration? And collaboration's a big, big buzzword today. Especially when you, you know, jobs out there is, ooh, are you a collaborator? And it's a business term that comes up a lot. It basically means can you play with a team? And uh, we're finding that the, there's not been a lot of research in this area. And academically, we think this is something that really, really needs to be pushed along. Yeah, it's particularly difficult in an academic situation uh, because we have all these myths in our culture, right? The myth of the individual. And in the academy, in schools, we say that, yes, we're going to measure you, make sure that you can do what we say you can do, and then we're going to send you out into the world. And there's no room in that for, yes, you can do it by yourself, but can you do it with somebody else as well? How do you measure one person's input within a team? And there are, are different attempts at, at trying to get around this problem, but by and large, it's just completely avoided, and we just say, no, we're just going to treat you as an individual. And this is even a, a, a subset of a larger issue within the United States in general and, and Western culture of the myth of the individual and how great one person can be. Yeah, you can be great, but you can be great as part of a group, too. And we've seen that a lot. Right, and uh, this idea of the myth, and we're, our work especially revolves around creative collaboration. And there's been this myth, um, really promoted by modernism especially too, uh, of the sole artist and you know the artist working in their studio all by themselves. But that's largely not really the case. I mean, artists were talking to each other. They had assistants. Um, they were working through ideas with each other. So there's that idea. And we're really looking at how that is can be expanded upon. Yeah, I think one of the things is, uh, to answer the question specifically, what is collaboration? It's a melding of ideas and minds and concepts to create something that's new and bigger than what one person could put together. Uh, with that in mind, we have, have three areas in which we've been really focusing on different types of collaboration. The first one um, it was called uh, instructed collaboration, and this is very, very similar to a business model. And what it comes down to is you have one person who has this goal in mind, this vision, whatever it happens to be, a new building, I don't know. And you have a bunch of essentially minions that go and carry it out. Um, there's not many, there's not much input that comes back in and the goal was never changed. We don't actually believe this to be a collaborative model, but this is one that people are very, very familiar with. We, on the other hand, are very interested in this uh, directed collaboration. And directed collaboration is this, it's a little different process. You still have one decision maker who has the goal in mind, but that goal can always be changed by the people that are with you and around you, your collaborative partners. And with that, they have input, and that can always be changed and moved, and it's, it, the goal becomes pliable. But that one decision maker's goal, their goal is to just keep things moving forward. But, but it's not just a case of an entire project is one goal, right? An entire project can contain many goals within it. And so you're trying, when you're collaborating in this way, you have to be aware that you have a responsibility if you are the, probably not leader, but the, the, the person who's responsible for a particular goal, uh, to gather everybody's input, synthesize it into a single thing, and then uh, present it back out to the group but you have to be willing to also give that responsibility up to others in their areas and let them lead their particular interests. And this model is um, one you, that you find a lot of artists working today, especially artists working interdisciplinary across disciplines too with scientists and engineers um, tend to use this model and it works well for that. Yeah, it's, it, yeah we, we actually think this is one of the best ones. The other model that people seem to be very familiar with, and uh, this is the third, is this mutual collaboration concept. And basically what this one is, you have one goal and you have a group of people that all give input into the goal, but the goal can't move unless the entire collaborative group decides that that's how it needs to change. 
Um, it, what happens in this process is it becomes slow. It becomes a lot of debate and a lot of moving around on how do we actually move this concept forward. And it, it becomes a real problem at some points. But, but it's not just a case of, you know, a lot of times when you're trying to make decisions together, you think, oh, well, there's one lazy person in the group that's not carrying their weight. Well, the opposite can be a problem too, right? There can be one person that's super hyped or super ambitious about something, and so they get their goal and they say, okay, I'm going to go accomplish this. And they work down the road and try to really come up with a solution, but then the rest of the group, when they, the solution's brought to them, they look at it and say, wait, what? We, we, we had no input into this. And that creates, in many ways, an even bigger problem than somebody who's not contributing in the first place. Hmm. And of course, these are, um, there are many more models, yeah. but these are the ones that we're really focusing on, that we're testing out and experimenting with. Um, so the big question is why is this important and why is this important to you? Because very simply, no matter what you end up doing in life, you're going to collaborate. Whether you are in education or you're in business or you're on a sports team uh, or in an art group, you will be collaborating one way or another. And the understanding this and an understanding of, of how collaboration works, it's very, very important. And it's important to teach too, right? Because you mm -hmm. can't just expect to be taught as an individual for however many years you're in school and then go out into the world and say, yes, I'm going to collaborate with somebody. Y there's a certain skill set involved, right? There's a certain attitude and a mind frame that you have to bring to it. And if you haven't been exposed to that, if you haven't been well, let me clarify, if you hadn't been exposed in a non-trivial way, which is the way that many collaborations in academia <laughs> are carried out, uh, then you're not going to be able to do that. So that's why we're trying to bake this uh, collaboration concept into academia at a much earlier level. And I think change, change is an important aspect yeah. to think about when thinking about collaboration, um, changing the way we're thinking about working together. But also, um, you know, it's kind of funny when we were putting this presentation together, um, we were going through images and um, all the images, there were no women. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know, why are there no women here? And um, that's just the way kind of the mentality was going. Um, they were always there, but just not shown. And a good example recently is uh, Jean, uh, Christo and Jean-Claude, his wife. Um, in, pr you know, previous work, he, it was always just, just um, attributed to Christo, when in fact, every project, his wife, Jean-Claude, was there and present and helping. Yeah, no, yeah, no, we always been there, and that's that's true for a lot of people's uh, partners or friends and stuff, in 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 the art world in particular. This this idea of raising up this one great artist is it's a huge concept, and acknowledging the people around them uh, doesn't happen very often. So uh, one of the big questions that people ask us all the time is, you're getting a PhD in collaboration. How does a collaborative PhD work? It's not like we write one dissertation, then cut it into three, and then we all have a third of a PhD. Uh, that's silly, and we can't figure out how that happens, even though that I think it's... <laughs> yeah, it does happen. Yeah, it's <laughs> like somewhere in Europe, there are actually you people are getting half a PhD, and we, we don't understand that one. Uh, but what we're actually doing is we have three completely separate dissertations, all focusing on the same subject, and we all contribute into each other's um, uh, dissertation. So what you end up with is, is a much broader uh, look at this particular subject of creative collaboration. Right, and it, it really is you know, creating something from multiple perspectives, right? So uh, Rick has a background in business and consulting, so he's got a certain view of collaboration. Uh, my background is in software development, particularly open source, and so that's got its own whole society built around it of what it values in, in terms of collaboration. Uh, Bethany, as <laughs> she's already mentioned, uh, demonstrated a couple of times here, has a background in art history and has looked at a lot of those artists that have collaborated together. So, right. And what we do, we really um, focus on and you f uh, utilize each other's strengths. Yeah. We each have our own um, strengths, uh, as John was saying too. And but this diagram is really pretty accurate about how we go about our collaborations in that we have our own areas. However, they're overlapping and we have input in each of the 
um, the other areas. I mean, we're doing it all together. It's not just me handling the environment or John handling scripting or Rick directing. We're all part of it. Yeah, and, uh, and that goes back too to the what we were talking about earlier, the different sub goals within a project, right? We all have the areas that we're responsible for making sure that other people have input on, right? It's not just a responsibility on our part, it's a responsibility to make sure that they are contributing too. Absolutely, and, and this diagram is a very good one because the results end up right smack dab in the middle and uh, our results turn out in, in our art practice as something we call a culinary incident which in general is a pretty over-glorified dinner theater at this point. Uh, what it end up, we not only collaborate with ourselves, but we end up collaborating with community and actors and other artists and craftsmen. And so people come in and, and they, you know, they, they'll build bowls and things like that for us. And in the end, what you end up with is this kind of uh, two-hour crazy immersion thing that we bring to the community and local food and so forth, and it it ends up being kind of uh, a fun at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's not the only result that we have here, yeah, right? Because we're really not only working together to produce these performances, but we're working together to figure out how a collaborative PhD can function because that's not something that you run into a whole lot. I mean, we <laughs> we've run into problems where uh, even the paperwork, right, for giving a somebody a PhD or for putting somebody through a PhD program is not configured in such a way to allow a collaborative PhD. We're talking about changing very fundamental systems here, and there's a lot that not only goes into it, but a lot that's going to come out of it in the end. Right, um, and one of the interesting and exciting parts of our, our PhD work is the praxis part, where we're actually putting the research into practice. And we do that together um, in these uh, events, but we also go outside and we work with other people. Um, I've worked with a number of artists just in different projects in different ways. I uh, recently this summer attended a, a residency program that just uh, looked at new pedagogical models of working together where you go and you live, you work, you create projects, uh, you clean the house, and it's all together uh, for three weeks. House, cl house cleaning collaboration, <laughs> I like it. Um, so uh, why collaboration is not taught today? Well, one of the big reasons that it's not taught in school is that we are very, very, very focused on this idea of this one person, this one hero, this you know, this great mind, this super person that's out there, and you know, it it's just we're we're constantly as a society trying to raise one person, people up. One of the things that I always bring up is every year we have a Super Bowl, and every year we have a football team that wins, but we spend an entire week after Super Bowl trying to dissect which one was the big hero, which one was the you know, and it and it actually it took that that whole unit to win and. But we're not going to spend any time on this model because you know this 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 doesn't make <laughs> this this doesn't help anybody. What what we really need to be talking about is why should it be taught? Yeah, and, and it should be taught because collaboration makes so many new things possible, right? We've talked a couple of times about how you meld new things. Well, when you cr are creative, when you're innovating, it's really when you're drawing from multiple fields. There's nothing new under the sun. Well, there's nothing new under the sun, particularly because people learn in one field and then they extend and extend and extend within that field, but they tend to not draw in from other fields. And when you innovate, that's when you synthesize multiple ideas from multiple backgrounds and come up with this new knowledge, this new thing that you put out in the world. And it goes back to this idea about utilizing your um, the qualities and skills of each of the person involved. When you are working with people that are coming from different um, areas of expertise, disciplines, you can really focus and put all of those uh, qualities into a really amazing project that you might not be able to accomplish otherwise, of course. Um, but it's just fusing those, um, those different ideas together to really making something new and creative. Yeah, and I, th I think that the thing that happens in a collaboration is not only is you might be I don't know, you have an idea of building a skyscraper, but in that process, when you're collaborating with other people, perhaps you're collaborating with audio engineers, you have to learn more than you would even for the project, and it's a way in which it's accelerating learning uh, to get to a greater goal. Uh, you know, it, the thing that we've been talking about and 
how how this is you know would have helped later on and the thing we're going to ask of all of you is to simply say think about the situations you've been in in your own practices in your own meetings in your own what happened wherever you end up being and think about it and say to yourself when would have learning how to collaborate and how to deal with these groups would have helped would have helped that move forward and I think the charge that we're going to put out onto you folks is to say, you know, collaborate with us and help starting to recognize that collaboration is actually a, a viable form of education and it can really, really uh, start to accelerate new ideas and new growth. Yeah, the three of us can do some work, but it's going, it, it's all these myths, all these social issues that we've talked about, it's going to require a lot more than three people. So everybody has to have this in mind and go forward with it. Absolutely. On that note, thank you. Anyway.